All right, everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure we're gonna get a few more folks that are gonna be logging in, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. We've got a great webinar ahead, a great panel discussion with a head for you uh, titled How AI and Automation Empowers Recruiting Teams Today and Tomorrow. We've got lots of great questions for the panel that we're gonna pose. And before we get started, I'm gonna introduce everybody and have them introduce themselves. So my name is Kevin Grossman. I'm the president of Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards. And every year we do benchmark research measuring candidate experience with companies big and small across industries. And Mark, why don't you introduce yourself and welcome. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you everybody for joining. My name is Mark Burkowski and I am the head of corporate recruiting and onboarding for AXA Equitable Financial Life Insurance Company. Uh, I've been in recruiting for way longer than I'm willing to admit out loud, uh, though I have to admit I thought I had seen everything until the last month. So I'm looking forward to this discussion and Kevin, thank you for inviting me. I know it changes by the hour, right Mark? It does. Absolutely. And we have uh, Jason Roberts. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Jason. Hello, my name is Jason Roberts. I'm uh, with Accenture. I'm the global talent acquisition capability leader. What that means is uh, as we look at how we best recruit uh, for ourselves and our customers that ask us to take care of that for them, um, it's my job to kind of come with the best practices, the tools, the technologies, and the methodologies to make that all work. Excellent. And last but certainly not least, Drew from Wade & Wendy, introduce yourself, please. Unmute. There we go. Uh, hi, I'm Drew Austin. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Wade and Wendy. Uh, Wade and Wendy is a recruitment engagement and, autom and process automation platform. So uh, this is going to be a, a really exciting discussion for us. Uh, I've had the luxury of working uh, of, of working with Mark um, and his team at Equitable and Jason uh, while he was at Randstad actually drove most of the the early adoption um, and introduced us to uh, Mark. So we've had a lot of great work together, all three of us. Excellent. Welcome you all very much and thanks for joining us today for this panel discussion. A couple of quick housekeeping items and then we're going to dive into some kind of background info first and then dive into the questions for the panel. First thing about housekeeping is that this is being recorded and we will make it available tomorrow to everybody who's attended and uh, as well as uh, make it available online, but we're glad you're here live with us today as well. And um, that will be happening then by tomorrow. So that's the big housekeeping item. Um, we will take questions later on in the webinar and you can submit those through either the Q&A part of the Zoom console or dashboard and or you can also use the chat function too and we'll make sure to take those later on based on anything that you hear in this panel discussion that we're going to cover today so now we're going to talk about a little bit of background because to say that we've been experiencing some changes of late would be kind of quite the understatement right there's always things that all of us in recruiting and hiring that are disruptive, that changes to leadership team, changes on a recruiting team, economic fluctuations, the list goes on. But we've had so much so fast with COVID-19. It is, sometimes it's a little uncomprehensible, right? To get our heads around all these things that are changing today and not what we need to do today, what we need to do tomorrow, the, the technologies that we should be using to, to help empower us today and tomorrow as well without really knowing what's coming next, when we're gonna come out of this, um, all those things we're gonna talk about today. And some, just some by the numbers, I'm sure you've seen many of these statistics. Uh, again, the, the level of unemployment is rapidly climbing, unfortunately. Many companies are freezing hiring or reducing hiring altogether. And uh, companies have basically said they've changed their entire process of hiring. Uh, many companies due to coronavirus, obviously that's the case. We can't have in-person interviews for the most part. A lot more things are happening virtually and that's just the beginning as well. So that kind of sets the stage. Everybody's seen enough of that. We understand that we're in this unprecedented change that's going on uh, globally right now. So the first thing that I wanna do, and I wanna start with, uh, with Mark, is that many of the recruiting teams are experiencing hiring freezes or reduced hiring. And we just saw that it was one of the statistics was from talent board candy research that we've done. So Mark, how have you seen those teams allocate their time and today, and then what is going on in regards to investing in the future at your organization in particular? Yeah. 
So I actually think the answers to those two questions would be the same. So for us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use this time to think uh, about how we might be better at what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So frequently, recruiting teams are so um, caught up in the day-to-day -day that we don't have a lot of time to think about how do we get better. Mm -hmm. So we're using this time on our team to think about how do we, um, without knowing when this is going to end, how do we become better at virtually recruiting? How do we improve our presence on campus in a virtual way? We had a belief that when you did a virtual career fair, people didn't show up. Now they have no choice. So how do we get better at being present at these virtual events? How do we get better at reaching out to diverse candidate pools and building those candidate pools for the future? So when the time comes and we're back to normal or even tomorrow, how are we better able to tap into those broader diverse candidate pools? So for the future, we have built that relationship and we're ready to go. We're trying not to stop. We're trying to think about this as sort of a continuum, not sort of there's walls. It's just going to keep going and we have to figure out how to bridge the gaps. I think that's one of the biggest things that I know the many conversations that I've had with many different organizations in our own candy community is just about how do we figure out to keep moving forward? Everything's been really screeched to a halt on, on many different levels, but how do we figure out how to keep moving forward, keep pipelining, even hiring? It sounds like that's what you're doing. Just one more quick note before I move on to the other panelists or one follow-up on that, Mark, is what have you learned right now to deliver better virtual career fairs? Is there anything that you can share with everybody now that based on what you're working on? Um, I think we've learned that that people are much more comfortable in this environment than we thought that they would be, that people are resilient, people are adaptable, and we all are, we're all in the same boat. This isn't a situation where we're sitting in New York and we're experiencing a set of circumstances and it's completely foreign to people elsewhere. We're all dealing with the same um, set of circumstances. And I think people are, are figuring out how to adjust and get things done and work in this environment. I've noticed that people are much more conscious when they're on video of what's behind them, right? So I've seen that people are adapting right, to, right. uh-huh, what's, you're looking over your shoulder and saying, what's behind me? So um, I, think, I think we've learned that people adjust to the circumstances and they make it work. Or they're using fun and strange virtual backgrounds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> or, that, or that too, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. So, hey, Jason, what about you? What, what are you saying? What are, um, and is, is there anything in particular, maybe with some of the companies you work with that from the professional and hourly side, how they're dealing with some of those, these same issues today and tomorrow? Yeah, it's, it's wild. I feel like I'm busier than I've ever been right now. Um, so what, what we're seeing is a combination of things. We've got, uh, certainly there are many teams that don't have as much time to allocate, right? They're, they've reduced their workforce uh, significantly, especially when it comes to recruiters. Mm -hmm. And um, even some of the best recruiters I know uh, are, have been impacted by this. So um, that's something we shouldn't gloss over. We should, we should right. recognize that that's a thing that's happened. Um, from a leadership perspective, what we're seeing is uh, many of these organizations have, have furloughed, especially uh, you know, we get to work with sort of a broad swath, not just the technology or financial services companies, but mm -hmm. also retail, consumer packaged goods, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, logistics supply chain folks that are delivering things to you every day and uh, keeping, <laughs> keeping our friends at Amazon busy. Um, so all of those, all of those sorts of, uh, of companies are approaching this differently, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the guys who happen to make toilet paper are super busy. Um, but, uh, yeah, Kimberly the, Clark, I've been talking to Kimberly Clark. Yep. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing. They're, they're busy these days. Um, but you've got, uh, you've got these retail organizations, large retailers that are, uh, that are struggling some, right? Mm -hmm. So they've got, they furloughed massive numbers of their employees. Um, and some, some of them just had to make quick decisions and, and do this very fast just for the survival of their own business. And uh, when they did that, 
that put them in a bit of a bind where many of the employees, especially uh, retail level, your distribution level, your, um, your sort of mid uh, to low uh, skill hourly workers, oftentimes don't keep the same phone number often. Right. They don't keep the same email for long. Um, they change addresses more often. So a lot of these furloughed workers, there, aren't, uh, there isn't good contact information for them because that's all changed since they joined, which is probably the last time their information was updated. So they're, they're really wrestling with, okay, how do we turn down this workforce? Yeah. But then how do we get ready to turn it back up? Right. right? And that's the really scary unknown here is the when, is, when do we turn it back up? And nobody's really clear on, on what that looks like. So we're seeing different types of organizations handle, they, they all have different problems. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a bit of a, a challenge. Um, what, we're, what we're running into is customers that were engaged with us before this that had called us to say, hey, can you help us figure out how to transform recruiting and do things a little differently? We're seeing those guys want to uh, accelerate things so that when the upswing happens, the upswing happens with a reinvented process like yeah. with the new technologies implemented with the new capabilities uh, identified and uh, and that's super heartening um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that in fact everyone that uh, the thing that's keeping me busy right now is scrambling to get people's uh, new updated processes and, and technologies aligned so that when we're ready for this upturn we have those things in place yeah. and uh, it's, it's really a good thing. People are taking advantage of the time right now. Yeah. And I, I, I've been hearing that a lot too. I know one of the things that, that I've been myself studying personally, Drew is scenario planning and something that's not anything new. It's been around for a long time, but we, we, this is pretty unprecedented that we're in right now. So to be able to plan for multiple contingencies of what, depending on, what we're, where we're at at that time, right? Kind of good, good guesses in different quadrants of what we should do if it's this or this or that. What else are you seeing and with the customers that you're working with? In, yeah, in so, place? yeah, I think uh, there's probably three types of companies that we're speaking with. I think the first one are companies that uh, their business has really been kind of derailed by this whole uh, uh, coronavirus. And I think that there's so much uncertainty that they're pretty much just frozen, waiting for some kind of like, uh, light at the end of the tunnel to provide some level of clarity. Um, there's there's a little bit of just stagnance. They're just going to wait and see until they can make some more informed decisions. The other two types of companies, um, which are the types of companies I think that we're really you know diving in with and spending most of our time with right now, are the second one is the company that is um, you know urgently hiring. Um, actually has more burden on their infrastructure. Um, than ever before, mm -hmm. and uh, needs to be able to scale quickly and handle an entirely new level of volume of both job recs, candidate volume, applicant volume, um, and then do that in a remote infrastructure that, that that is often completely new to them as a talent acquisition organization. So supporting those types of companies with a technology platform to be able to, you know, screen more applicant volume that's coming in, source candidates, even if, and, and a lot of these companies are now opening up remote work um, or remote job opportunities. So being able to source um, at a, without the constraints of geography um, is a very different task for a lot of recruiters. That's one of the, usually the most um, constraining components of a, a recruiting process is the geography. Um, and now with the remote work, that's going to change a lot. So providing the right technology infrastructure for those companies to be able to ramp up quickly and scale, I think is very important. And then the third, which I think is what Mark was getting to, and I, and I think that it's honestly where uh, I, the companies that we're really seeing almost probably the most right now are the companies that are saying, hey, we want to be proactive at this point. You know, we want to use our talent acquisition resources, keep our team in place as much as possible, um, but use as an opportunity to uh, build a more digital first recruiting process. So implement and identify new technologies, um, even start to upskill some of the talent acquisition team members. So as opposed to just, you know, sourcing, screening, scheduling, um, you know, top of funnel recruiting process, 
process is they start, you know, we're starting to talk to and work closely with our, our partners and customers around ideas like, you know, how do we start to build more uh, you know, talent, talent analytics specialists or uh, recruiting marketing specialists or candidate experience specialists or technology and implementation specialists, change management uh, uh, opportunities. These kind of new skill sets are probably going to become, you know, part of the future of a talent acquisition team. And the, the reason why that bandwidth and capacity is, is both is possible right now is A, because some of these companies may not be hiring as much, but B, they've already started to implement some of this automation. Um, or they've been thinking about off automation or they're building some process around automation. So it's created some flexibility into being able to shift some of the traditional responsibilities off to uh, automation and technology and be able to take on some new thoughtful challenges and start to build the future of a talent acquisition team. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, and one thing I wanted to comment on that, just because candidate experience is, is in my wheelhouse with the research that we do, I know that five years ago, when you would do a search for candidate experience in anybody's either job descriptions or even in their titles, um, it was a much, much lower number than what you what I see today if you go out on LinkedIn and search for that. And I mean, that just the specialization that you were just referencing that we have been seeing growing with the recruiting, I think is going to be even more critical in, in, again, in this unprecedented realm that we're in today as we plan for what can we do today. And then when we probably many organizations, many companies, depending on the business and the industry, there may be stage surge hiring at some point when, okay, because it's not going to be like this one big switch. I'm sure all of you would agree with that. We're not just going to say, hey, we're back to normal. We're never going back there again. That is not happening. So what? it's going to be kind of staged in that regard. Anyway, I don't want to wax poetic too much. But let's, uh, Drew, let's stay with you um, on this one, and, and then we'll go to the rest of the, the panelists. So are your clients, are they, are, again, we, now we've touched on this a little bit already, but how else are they preparing for the hiring bounce back, whatever that means to them and their industries and their businesses? Yeah, um, it's a lot about uh, some, it's about a lot about implementing some of those, like what I was saying earlier, change management processes. So how do we start to think about um, with implementing automation and technology, uh, A, what are some of the new metrics, KPIs, measures of success that we're going to look for to be able to see how things are performing, but also how do we iterate effectively on what we're learning? Because a lot of, for most organizations, as they start to make the wave into a digital first, AI driven, automated driven um, recruiting functions and recruiting organization, they're going to, uh, there's going to be a lot of learning uh, and a lot of, uh, uh, and it, it's important to pay close attention to the data so that we can start to see opportunities to advance and improve and and really uh, and continue to grow um, and, and improve the situation. I think that the other key thing is that a lot of organizations, I think one of the things, uh, I think actually, Mark, you might have been the one who said this once. You're like, yeah, it was a, you're like, it's a recruiter on demand. Um, and when he was describing Wendy, our AI recruiter, he's like, it's like a recruiter on demand. And, um, and I think that that was a really powerful statement for us because what we've realized is at a time like this where some companies have to do massive layoffs, mm -hmm. um, and, and that means even cutting their recruiting organization as well, when this ramp up starts to happen, it probably will happen faster than we expect. I don't think it'll happen um, to the full extent. I don't think we'll get back to their period. Um, to get back 22 million people back in the workforce, um, we're going to need new new job openings to, right. it, altogether. But um, the ability to scale up and scale down with with, with putting as least the uh, the least amount of burden on a on a constrained or reduced talent acquisition staff, I think is really really important. Um, so it's really about how do you build a, a, an appropriate tech stack? How do you educate your your uh, your recruiting staff and your hiring managers? How do you Build a organization that that thinks how do we how to, about machine and human collaboration. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. This is not a tech only or human only recruiting world that we're entering into. It is a, firmly about human and machine collaboration, and that handoff is going to be vital. And and refining the strength of that handoff and the points of handoff uh, are what a lot of talent organizations are doing right now. I, I th thankfully. And I completely agree with you. I, I, I think finally that there's there's been enough and more education in the space and that will continue to pro proliferate. I, can, I can't even speak that word, so I won't even try again. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, that relates to the benefits of AI-related smart technologies, how they can help 
again, empower the recruiting teams, but it isn't about dis full displacement. The displacement we're seeing now is a healthcare crisis, unfortunately. Um, but this is a way, again, for them to work more collaboratively between machine and man. It sounds like we could do a documentary right now, but you know what I mean, though. Mm -hmm. So I have to have a little levity, folks, right? We got to have a little levity uh, as we go through this. Jason, what, what about you as it relates to that? What some of the customers? I mean, you touched on a few things. What else are you seeing how they're preparing for whatever this hiring means to them at some point? Yeah, I think uh, so. The what's interesting is the this furlough situation is it's a classic sourcing problem, right? Mm -hmm. You've got this pool of talent you have to keep in touch with, keep them informed on what's happening, um, give them a channel through which they can know when you're when jobs open up, when the timing is right for them, and the right and the timing is right for you, and then you can um, you can uh, send out a message and trigger the ability for them to come to your come to work for you. That's the that's the whole purpose of uh, of candidate relationship management and talent pool management that's happened for a really long time. Classic sourcing problem, and so what we're starting to see is some of the some of the furloughed pools managed like a classic talent pool, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's good, and that's needed for the bounce back, right? You have to you have to bring it back with, with something like that. Um, the the other thing I, I mentioned that uh, these guys are they're go, going ahead and starting to implement technologies, the new processes, get those ready so that when the ramp happens, they're they're ready to ramp. You know, it's funny, we, we have a client that has, you know, <clears throat> tens of thousands of, of workers that, that are in um, sort of warehousey, factory type settings that, are, that aren't working right now. And, you know, we initially talked to them about, okay, hiring uh, tens of thousands of people for them per year. Now they need to hire tens of thousands of people almost overnight, right? Because they'll have to rehire that entire workforce. Think about that a significant percentage of the U.S. workforce will all have to be hired at the exact same time. There will be a massive hiring event that takes place coming out of this thing. And um, companies are trying to get their heads around exactly how do they process that? How do they get their arms around that as a part of the restart? That's the hardest part of the restart in my mind, right. is that massive hiring event that has to take place. Yeah, that's and that's why... Mark, I know I've been, I've talked to many organizations and the question that they've been grappling with is pipe, to pipeline or not to pipeline. Espe even if, like, especially if they are frozen, if they have frozen hiring right now or reduced hiring dramatically um, and maybe only key essential hires that they're making, do we have a talent pool like Jason was just talking about where we kind of stay in touch with them and nurture them, that talent community that we've been talking about for a long time and keep them as warm as we can, knowing at some point there's going to be multiple companies all at once needing some of these key groups, right, that we've hired for before. So how, what, is, what is your approach to that right now? So I think that's right. I think the, the talent community also wants to hear from us. Yeah. So I think that there's a certain sense of um, reassurance that this will come back and that people are reaching out to me and they do want to hear from us. So we are... Um, trying to continue to pipeline. We think that's never a bad idea. So the more connections we can make, the people are hearing from us, we're building those relationships during this time when things are so difficult. I think that pays dividends in the long run. The yeah. thing that, that we're working on and the thing that scares me the most is yeah. that the bounce back will come. There's no right. doubt in my mind that the bounce back will come. What that's going to look like, I don't know. but we all know in recruiting that when the bounce back comes, I'm not going to be able to say to my business, well, wait until I get my recruiting team back into place. Right. I, I'm not, none of us are going to get that luxury. Right. So we're really trying to make sure that we are maintaining our teams. We're keeping them busy because that, that bounce back is going to happen and we're going to be expected to deliver in the moment because those critical hires are gonna be needed because of the fact that we put things on hold, that we've slowed things down. So right, right. we have to be prepared to move in the moment. And I think 
that collaboration between person and technology is going to be so critical, but you need to have both sides, right? So we can have the technology, but if we lose the people along the way who then execute and help us build those relationships after we've leveraged the technology to do what it does so well, we're going to be in trouble. So that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about how do we approach this from both sides of the equation to make sure that we have the technology in place, that we continue to leverage it, but also that our recruiting teams are ready to go when that inevitable bounce back does occur. Right. I can, right. I'm, I'm curious about something. Yeah. Um, you want to go, Drew? Drew you want to go first? I don't do it. Do it so. Okay. Uh, Kevin, you were talking about the, uh, the talent pooling and to talent pool or not to talent pool. Yeah along the way. And I, I think the what's interesting about these furloughed guys is there it's a it is a classic talent pool uh, problem with a classic solution. But I've been in that struggle personally. Like I I've rolled out CRMs to literally hundreds of companies where I can't get anyone to use the thing. Mm-hmm. And the the pipelining talent pools, I think it we may be at this point where if you have good matching, you have bots that can reach out to candidates who are a good fit for your job. Do you need to maintain contact with a, a pool of people over a period of time? The, the whole idea of, of that concept, I think may, uh, we did that because we wanted people to sort of voluntarily sign up to, to get email alerts really, right. when jobs that, that were sort of in a sphere of, of interest that they have mm-hmm. showed up. But when you can pinpoint exactly the right person that fits exactly the right job and send a, a direct communication to them and ask them questions about that job, do you still need a talent pool? Like, is there a point to that thing anymore? I mean, I, I, I can add, I'll say, Mark, you can answer so that. So I think, Jason, I think the answer is yes. I think the beauty of the talent pool is the connection that you make on the front end. Right. So without that connection, without building that talent pool, you're reaching for someone out of the blue. Right. And so at least if they've heard from you at some point along the way, Mm -hmm. you've you've climbed half the hill. But if you're reaching out to someone at a point where it's just benefiting you as an organization versus potentially them as a candidate um, without. I think you you don't end up building the kind of relationship that becomes a productive one as quickly as you might need it to when the time comes. So I do think there's still a need to build those talent pools. And I, I'll add to that really quickly. I also think that there's a, a maybe there's tends to be new ways to look at it. I I, I think that some of the mm-hmm. challenges you see with CRM uh, adoption amongst recruiters is that they're just bombarded with actual real-time recruiting yep. to sort of spend time marketing and also not necessarily trained as marketers, right. which a CRM right. is really built for. Um, you have challenges with adoption and effective use. You know, for us, our design and our design approach and thinking has always been to automate tasks and uh, free up work. So we try to do a lot of the outreach, engagement, and nurturing to be able to uh, keep the brand, the company, the recruiter brand, the hiring brand top of mind. I think that's really important. But also through that interaction and engagement, that, that scalable engagement, we're able to gather information, filter information, present information so that the recruiting teams can then really focus their attention on the most engaged, most qualified, most um, you know, excited, enthusiastic candidates. So you know, for us, it's, like, it's interesting. We, you know, we partner with companies like Randstad SourceRight, they're, you know, an RPO, and they, you know, are obviously a, a high touch environment, very personalized uh, recruiting processes, but they work with companies like ours so that they can be able to have the bandwidth and capacity to even develop um, those stronger relationships and be able to be more thoughtful on how they approach the recruiting process. So I think you're seeing like the perfect scenario is when companies like ours and companies like Randstad come together, you have the human expertise and you have the automation and technology. We can really then introduce uh, a, a real tech and touch process. And I think that's really important. It, it, it is sounds very like a great important. idea. Drew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just, just a matter of time, gentlemen, we want to, I want to keep moving because we've got some other questions to get to. So if that's okay, we can, can we jump to the next one? Jason, did you want to make a quick note real quick? Go ahead. <laughs> no, a little joke there. Drew and I worked <laughs> together on some of the things he was talking about. Oh, got it. Okay. All right. Um, 
so we've we've kind of already been talking a little bit big picture about this in particular about you know what historically make it can be automated in, the, in a high touch process right in our organizations today um what kinds of data and insights that as as recruiting teams we need to to leverage look at under analyze understand to make better decisions um so let's start actually this time with jason and a lot of the organizations that you're working with what are you advising on with a lot of these these organizations and even with your own when it comes to what can be automated and the kinds of data and information that need to you need to look at on a daily basis weekly basis monthly basis to make better overall decisions in hiring and what can you prep for now when we do start seeing that bounce back surge hiring coming yeah so automation's interesting you see um you see this in a couple of different areas of the process right so there's task level automation mm -hmm. where you know if, if there's all the administrative and junk that you do every day um, that can be automated away so that machines are just doing that work right and there are uh, there are tools that are really good at being a task bot that can, that can make those things happen and then there's some higher level automation that can be done and the top of funnel i think is actually the the more complex automation right mm -hmm. so the the um can i go through a, a set of screening questions uh can i and then trigger a self schedule for an interview and, and those sorts of things those are the things that sort of happened immediately and honestly if, if you're not doing that yet you probably ought to be um especially for a lot of repetitive hiring too though right exactly Let's, yeah especially high volume high yeah. volume where you you have you need to ask the same questions over and over that if if that hasn't been automated in some way then uh, then it needs to be um, but uh, the the really hard stuff I think is actually top of funnel so being able to search for candidates that are a good fit match those candidates and then the big trick with automation uh, on top of funnel is screening mm -hmm. so what people don't realize is when you put a bot in typically uh the bots require a um configuration of the chat mm -hmm. so somebody has to tell that bot what to say right. and what questions to look out for and the the intentions of of responders and that sort of thing you've got to create all of these sort of individual chats over a period of time and you might be able to pick from a library of chats but every time you've got to set up the chat that's, mm -hmm. that's part of your job and um, one of the, actually the reason that Drew and I spent so much time together with Wade and Wendy is that Wendy writes her own questions and that's pretty cool. So I think yeah, that's, cool. the, that's the harder part right. uh, of this whole thing and being able to, to search, match, uh, write, the, write the questions, ask the questions and engage those candidates, that's the, that's the money shot right there. That's where, that's where you need to go. Um, so I think you can, you can automate nearly, well, I say nearly everything, anything that doesn't require empathy, that doesn't require touch, that doesn't require a, uh, a unique decision can be automated. Right. Um, use humans for personal touch, unique decisions, empathy, and decision-making and that's, and everything else, try to automate it if you can. Hence that collaborative dance that we were talking to earlier on in, in this webinar too. So, so Mark, what about at your organization um, in regards to this? Is that something that you, you've you worked to, to, uh, to achieve as well? Yeah, so we use Wendy um, at the top of the, at, for the top of the funnel assessment. Um, I, I think the recruiting profession we've done ourselves a little bit of a disservice along the way. I think we focused so much on candidate experience that we forgot about the recruiter experience. And I think what Wendy allows us to do is that recruiters do what recruiters do best, which is interact with candidates and interact with the right candidates. Sure. So I, I've been doing this for a really long time and you, we've all, who've been in this profession, we've experienced this. We have a requisition we have to fill. We have to fill it in a certain amount of time. And all of a sudden we've posted it and we have 250 candidates who apply. Now that would be great if that was my only requisition and I would talk to all 250 of those candidates, but I've got 25 others that right. I've got to work on at the same yeah. time. 
So what do I do, right? Do I talk to the first 20? Do I talk to the middle 20? How do I make the, I'm not gonna have time to talk to all 250. So the likelihood that I, I make the best hiring decision is a little bit up in the air. With Wendy, being at the top of our funnel, Wendy can point us in the right direction. Wendy helps us decide who it is that we should talk to out of those 250 people. Sure. So our recruiting team is spending the time with the candidates that they should be spending the time with. Now, every candidate in the pipeline is important and I'm not trying to uh, say that it's not, but we've got finite resources there. I don't think that there's a head of a recruiting team who thinks their recruiting team is overstaffed. So we are in a position where we have to make those choices. And I think that um, partnership between technology and people, especially with Wendy asking questions specifically about requisitions because we work with the team to build the chat. So it's very much targeted to the requisition, gives our recruiters an advantage in terms of getting through uh, to the candidates that they need to get through. Now, we have some things to work on. We have to integrate Wendy with our ATS. I think that would make things much easier for our recruiting teams, and that's on our roadmap. But the best decisions are, are we talking to the best candidates for the role who meet the qualifications that we put out there? And I think that partnership between technology and, and person is how we're trying to, to use that top of the funnel technology automation. I agree with you on recruiter experience and hiring manager experience as well. Yes. I mean, all these things are important. I think from a candidate's perspective, um, as long as I'm being engaged, engaged with somehow communicated with, and there's definitive closure at the end of the day, I don't care what you're using on, on, right. on the other. I mean, to be perfectly honest, unless I'm in the actual HR recruiting technology space, they, that's what they care about at the end of the day. And if these, if this collaborative dance between man and machine is, is helping to you better to, to find those individuals that you want to hire while telling the others, thank you, but no, thank you definitively every single time that goes a long way with candidate experience, but drew hmm? Wendy's writing her own questions. Come on. No. So the, the, the thing that I wanted to um, uh, really kind of explain is that it actually is powered by the job description. So it's really important for the job description. And this is one of the things we talk to every talent team that we work on. The, the, the job rec gets parsed um, in a variety of different ways from, you know, uh, we use a variety of different natural language processing techniques to understand sentences, sure. to understand context, understand skills and entities. And uh, that then generates, then that from that, we are able to generate questions that target the qualifications and responsibilities and experiences that that role is looking for. And we can also leverage like domain knowledge as well, because especially uh, job in job sectors or job types that we've seen a lot, we're able to build up a knowledge domain uh, around that type of uh, role. But the, the big thing is, is, is that it's really imperative for recruiting organizations to start thinking about job description generation um, because that in a way that it works well with machines because that's their communication point with the machine. Mm -hmm. So for us, like in, to answer this question, I think there are a few different type of uh, few pieces like pillars of automation that we focus on. You know, we do the top of funnel screening, which Mark was talking about um, and uh, be able to just, again, help qualify and also not only just qualify from a, uh, do they have the experiences, but also qualify that they're actually engaged in a time like now with one click apply everywhere and you know frictionless apply the fact that someone is willing to take the time and go through a chat filters out some of those 250 applicants in a way that you want to be filtering people out you want people that are going to do the, the appropriate steps to go through and get the job so there's an element of that i think on the other side we do have a, 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 a sourcing automation very different style chat it's much more about how do we present the opportunity the role and the company in an effective way. So there's videos, there's images. It's a different style chat experience. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we are still doing a, a lighter qualification to ultimately say, hey, here's a new candidate to add to your pipeline. On the other side of things, we're also doing things like automated scheduling and now even programmatic advertising. So these little pieces where someone would have to manage 
you know, whether it's managing all the calendar scheduling appointments to get people on the books or, you know, manage the, uh, the, the same cell chat to a prospective candidate, reach out, write the email. Pers we send those personalized messages. You don't need to manage that yourself. We target, we send the, generate the messaging, we send, ha invite to a chat and then present. The, the major responsibilities that we, um, that, we don't, that we don't do is A, we need the job description and a calibration of that job description. Sometimes the job description can be more marketing speak. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity to calibrate that job rec and say, hey, this is actually what's really most important for this role, or here are some other things that are gonna go beyond the job description that are important. That's really, that, that's, that's vital because it, 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 it's basically training Wendy to understand what should she chat about and then what should she search for um, and evaluate on. Second, the final piece is decision making. She's gonna make recommendation, recommendations, she's gonna gather data for you, she's gonna synthesize that data, she's gonna present insights, but then at the end of the day, the decision is still up to the recruiter on how they wanna proceed. Um, and then once that decision is made, she then confirms, coordinates the scheduling process, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of really different things. And then the other final piece I wanna bring up is that when you have technology in place in these multiple different areas, sourcing, screening, mm -hmm. programmatic advertising, the data that becomes actionable and useful is completely new. So we can start to think about how do we optimize the funnel? How do we optimize resource allocation? How do we make sure we're not presenting you too many candidates or too little candidates? to get you the right amount of funnel to fill that job most effectively from the various sources of your proactive outreach, your active pool of uh, proactive outreach of passive job seekers, your active pool of people that are going on the job boards, and the people that have just applied through your career page. So there's just a lot of uh, what I think is when we start to bring in automation and technology, it's not only the workflow and tasks that get, that get um, offloaded, but the data and insights enable the, the human recruiting team to be able to strategically make more informed decisions, optimizing resources, uh, putting in new capabilities, new skills, developing deeper relationships with the talent pipeline that's, uh, that, that is in the pool. So, and I completely agree, um, and all of those things, all of those different automated touch points with candidates that you were that you've all been talking about right now, we know and we see how that that translates in our data, that there's that can help improve a higher level of perceived fairness in the process. That candidates again, the more that they are being engaged through the process and communicated with in different capacities, and some of the different even media that you that you said can be a part of these conversations um, at the end of the day that actually really helps to have much higher positive candidate ratings and perceived fairness considering the majority of the candidates still are not going to be hired at the end of the day and by the way drew can can wendy help under me understand my own sentences because that's that's the <laughs> That's what I need. It's not, it's not that sort of AI, Kevin. It depends on how much you've had to drink. What? No? <laughs> depends yeah. on how much you've had to drink tonight. <laughs> oh, man. I, I'm going to need some of that help. All right. Well, listen, we're going we're gonna to kind of try to power through some more, a few more things before we take questions, all right? So just okay. really uh, briefly, Mark, let's start with you. And this is a big question, actually, I think, for a lot of people that are going to – All right. Now, to where do you start when it comes to optimizing – the, again, this collaborative dance between technology and individuals, where do, where do you start? So I think from my perspective, you have to start with your recruiting teams, right? You have to understand where the pain points are, right? Because at the end of the day, the users of the tech are going to be the recruiting team. And if you don't have buy-in, if you don't have um utilization of the recruiting teams you've got a wonderful tech stack that sits and gathers dust mm -hmm. you spend a lot of money and recruiters go back in and do what they've done for years and years and years and years and you have done yourself an incredible disservice so i think you have to start with your recruiting teams understand what it is that they do how they do it where they run into roadblocks that's, in all honesty, what led us to the partnership with, with Wade and Wendy through Ronstadt, is that our recruiters could not get to the candidates mm -hmm. that were applying for the jobs. We, that was an organization, and, and we're not huge, we're probably mid-sized. We, we have in excess of 40,000 people applying to us every year. I have seven or eight recruiters on my team. That's just not 
the math doesn't work. Right. So you have to start with the recruiting team and then you think about the technology, right? We've, we've have ATS um, platforms that do all kinds of things. We're not utilizing that functionality because recruiters have not bought into the use of those functions with the ATS. So we started with recruiting bef- to figure out what problem are we trying to solve, right? Before we actually went out and solved a problem. Because if you don't do that, I think you end up just spinning your wheels. So that's, that's where we started. And, and I think we, we've come to a good place where we've got technology in place that's helping the recruiter do their job. And they are um, hopefully encouraged, engaged, and it makes sense for them to use the technology that we've given them. Mm-hmm. And, and Jason, there's so many companies that we see big and small across industries that do unfortunately spin their wheels, right? That they're not, they're not looking at their processes first and their recruiting teams first. And what is, what are they trying to solve for before they implement some of these things? So what do you recommend to companies then and, and your, your customers? I, I think Mark is right. Um, it's, I, I think we start with the recruiters mm-hmm. and there's a, a skill that we start, we've started looking for um, called digital fluency. So basically your level of comfort in using technology is a big deal. And um, I've, been, I've been talking about the AI impact on TA for a while in a few different forums. And people get worried about this idea of you know, the Terminator bot coming for their job. It's not that at all. Mm. It's more like autopilot, right? You right. still need a, a human being to, to set things up. If right. you, listen, I tried this. I tried it without a person going in and cleaning up the job description every single time. And it didn't work. Like Drew was there. It did not work. So you have to have, uh, you have to have the uh, human being at takeoff. You have to have them monitoring things during flight. And then at landing, somebody's got to close that candidate. And, uh, and machines don't do it well. So you still need uh, people. So it's more like autopilot on a plane. And people with digital fluency is, are really the key to that and um, help with it. So that's, that's the first bit. The other thing is, you know, we actually did build a process that was built to be, it was actually designed to be a hundred percent fully automated sourcing model. And we quickly realized we needed some human touch points Mm -hmm. and uh, we needed human touch points at the very beginning with that, um, with, with that job description and then there is a human touch point that shows up uh, once a candidate has been uh, matched and screened and it looks like they're a good fit. You actually have to make contact with a candidate at that point. So there, there's a lot of uh, self-scheduling of interviews or even just sending a quick text or a call that can happen there. But they need to, uh, before they wait too long, they need to know there's a human on the other end of that. And it doesn't have to be a long call, but it needs to be a human being that interacts with them mm-hmm. for, at some point. So there are points in the process that you identify. And, you know, we designed it, again, to be 100% technology. But then we started identifying places where we had drop-off because uh, people needed to talk to people. Right. And we started to insert more touch in those spots along the way. I think that's great. And I, my best friend from college is an airline pilot. We still need the airline pilots. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we, still, we still need them to, to fly the planes. So, Drew, what do you want to add to that as we yeah. kind of start to round out this? this uh, I webinar? think it's essential. I mean, part of the reasons why we, we see success with uh, you know, Mark and, uh, and his team is, is some of the leadership that we get uh, and management that we have and the, and the buy-in and the, and, the, and the driving of these accounts at, at the, from the ground all the way up. Um, so I think there needs to be a few things. I think one is there needs to be ince- aligned incentives. I think that recruiters, if they understand that this is that the, that technology is here to make to to make them more successful at their job, to make their company be able to build great teams, build them faster, build them more cost effectively, to help people get hired faster. Um, and not, a, it, we need to look at it as how do we, how does the technology make the human beings perform better? How has it become a, a strength, a strength, a muscle that you can 
um, build and grow. And I think that from recruiters' perspectives, I would be, uh, if, you know, I was a recruiter for five years. So when I started this company, it was a lot of it because I was a practitioner and I felt the pains myself. So I, I looked at this and I said, uh, the recruiters that I think are really digging their teeth in, are enthusiastic, are trying to learn, are trying to drive it forward, they're going to not only, you know, they're going to be uh, essential in talent acquisition organizations because mm -hmm. people are going to need to be experts in implementation. In, and, and I'll tell you that those people are usually the ones that give us the best product feedback, the people that say, hey, you know, you know, for example, when we the reason why we released scheduling is because we saw um, we were working closely with an account uh, with an account team, and they were saying, "Hey, we're getting so many great candidates up front." Um, but then, uh, you know, once we th they're not showing up to the interview day. This was on more of like a labor style type of uh, job function, and we realized there was about a seven day window between when Wendy got them to say yes, I'm interested, to when they had to show up to that interview. And what we did was we, A, we reduced that time period. We, 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 we started Wendy's outreach uh, later in the process because we wanted to make it closer to the interview day. But we also did two, one other things. We added a self-scheduling, um, and uh, which also gave us, because we now knew the time and date that they were booked for an interview, now Wendy can send a follow-up, uh, a, a reminder text message. Hey, you have your interview tomorrow. Here's where you're going. Here's the time. Here's the location. So because of that, just because of getting close feedback, um, from committed and invested users on the recruiting side, we were able to add features because I'll tell you, no matter what company you're talking to in the recruitment automation space, we are all in the early innings here. Nice. So a, a collaborative environment between the product organizations, the software companies, and the, the end users and the recruiting functions from the buyer down to the recruiter, even the candidate who we serve, you know, we survey every candidate that goes through our experience. You know, that feedback is going to make this platform and product um, and vision that we all have come to life so much more, uh, you know, faster, more effectively, um, and tailored to the needs and so of, of the pain points that, you know, they're, they're, that like Mark is saying, they, they want to solve pains. It, the more vocal they can be about pains, the, fat, the, the better we can try to work to solve them. So I think, uh, you know, I think that's really important. Absolutely. And if, if Wendy can remind me to set reminders that I'm not even aware of yet. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you know, Kevin. <laughs> let me know when that happens, because that would be very, very, very helpful. So I think unfortunately we're really we, we want to take some questions. So I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to fast forward us right now. And I think a lot of these things and even the remaining questions we we did touch on a lot of stuff today mm -hmm. with everybody. So I, just because of the time and we want to take some questions from the audience, I have my global program manager Ron Mockamer on. So Ron, do do we have any questions for the panelists that we can answer as we wind down? Yeah, we do. Um, great job, everyone. Um, we got a compliment wishing to uh, tell everyone that, that everyone did a great job. So that was one. Um, one was asking if, if Wendy bases um, this on basic screening for a rec, how does it compare with an AI that will stack rank based on resumes? Um, yeah, um, just real quick. So yes, the, the, the screening is based on the, the requirements that are in the requisition. Um, and I think the interesting thing about stack ranking resumes versus what Wendy does is that, is that Wendy is out there trying to gather information, um, updated information that is specifically relevant to the requirements of that job. Um, so it goes beyond some of the, you know, the keyword matching or, you know, just the, uh, you know, we can go out and get further context or ask follow up questions. And the last piece is that we're also presenting an engaged candidate, someone who's not only has not only been matched, but has expressed interest is engaged and is available for that job. So at the end of that experience, you have someone who's really ready to uh, really be pushed through the process. So I, I think where the stack ranking resumes comes, into, comes in really handy is even directing Wendy on who to even spend her time engaging, um, which is again, something Jason and I worked on uh, together a bit, mm -hmm. is that when you have some upfront, when you have different type, you know, a lot of companies will come to us and say, hey, we don't want you just engaging external pools. Can you look at our own database of job seekers? And can you re-engage the ones that we, that are, you know, our ATS or matching software thinks what might be reinterested in a job that we've opened. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can think about that. Excellent. Thank you, Drew. Mm -hmm. What else, Ron? Um, so one question was asking how candidates expectations are changed by the recruitment process. Um, I'm thinking just with everything going on, like how do you, how do you think candidate expectations have changed um, just about processes and everything? 
Wow. I think this is, I think this is interesting from a, a um, candidate experience perspective, right? I think that, uh, you know, candidates were the, it was a seller's market for a while, right? So if, if the uh, hiring people are, are the buyers, man, the, the candidates were really in charge. People were saying the war for talent is over, the, the candidates won. And it's, it's true, they, they did. But that we just had the, the tides turn on us, right? So it switched from 3% unemployment to 15 plus at this point, right? So, you know, what does that mean now? And what expectations do they have? I, I agree, it's a good question. I, I think to some extent it's a, hey, I need a job, help me get a job, period. Yeah, that they were looking for job. That's it. I was going to throw that out. I think the, one of the things that, and, and Mark, I know you can attest to this too. I think everything that you do as an organization today, any any communication with your candidates, for whether they're the most unqualified to the most qualified, is going to impact your business and your brand for not only months to come, but for a long time to come. You're gonna. We have millions of more people that are in back out there looking for jobs right now. Companies that are hiring have already been inundated, if not, if not if will be soon, with a lot, with even a bigger volume than we've ever had before of applications. But every, it's, that's why it's more critical, I would argue, based on what we know and see. And we've only been doing this candidate experience research, by the way, in a growth market for nine years, right? Now it's a completely different landscape. And we're gonna see what that looks like. But I, I think, expectations are are you know just the minimal expectations of acknowledgement and closure you come employers have to still do that and automation can help them do that actually at the end of the day so that's my two cents mark yeah i've i gave up a long time ago trying to predict what candidates will do or won't do <laughs> right sure. and, and what what they think i think from a recruiting perspective our job is to give them the best possible experience that we can. And the circumstances have changed, but we as, as a recruiting function, we have opportunities, I think, now to create, I think, moments for candidates, yep. which will allow them, if we do this correctly, given the circumstances, Kevin, you're exactly right. Candidates will remember this time yeah. and who treated them well and who, and it, it would be easy to say, oh, well, we've got 22 million people recently who have filed for unemployment. Well, you know what? Those people are gonna remember the experiences that they've had in this time when things were toughest for them. And they will be candidates, they will be customers. They're, so to think of this any differently than we would in the past and treat them as well as we possibly can, I think we're making a mistake. Great. Yeah, completely agree. Drew, any last, any last thought on that before we wrap up? Uh, on what piece? Oh, just on the can, how we treat candidates' expectations. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, the, the thing is this, and I, this was one of the earliest, when we first started the company, we were sitting on my couch, there's four people. Uh, the first realizations we had early on that made us feel that, that we were onto something is that um, candidates were spending 20 to 30 minutes talking to Wendy about their career. Um, and then saying thank you at the end yeah. of that. Whereas sure. like, I've never seen a candidate in history say thank you to the ATS after they have filled in, put in their application. So I, I felt that there was, uh, and we are always very upfront, this is a machine, this is an AI recruiter. Um, we believe that the, at the foundation of a conversation is trust. So you need to be upfront. There's no hiding this that we're replacing a human being. This is a machine and this is her job. Right. But, so I, I think that that is a, I, I think like the element of, uh, you know, thinking about the candidate, the response, like I, I, it's been interesting. We always get asked questions like, uh, you know, is it only for millennials? I'll tell you like the metric we've seen that, that from a data perspective, we have wide ranging groups of people from age demographics, geographies, because at the end of the day, the, 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 you know, the carrot at the end of the stick to engage with the machine is a job and that's very important. So they're going to go through the experience that's presented in front of them. And, you know, we get a, I think we have a plus 48 net promoter score um, from, from surveyed candidates, which is like Apple right. of candidates really saying, yes, I enjoyed the opportunity to be able to tell my story, to be able to answer questions about the job that I think could sell myself and, and give me a chance to be 
uh, to be better uh, evaluated. And we hear from recruiters all the time that, you know, they were going to pass on someone because of the resume, but then they were able to see the insights from the chat and they ended up moving the person forward and they got hired. So that's, uh, you know, that's a really powerful, a powerful thing. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being a part of this panel discussion and Wade and Wendy, a special thanks to you. If you have any other questions that we didn't get to folks, you can reach out to that email that you see on the screen um, and feel free to do that. And we appreciate everybody's time today. And again, we'll be sending out the recording to you all tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for joining us, panel. Thanks. All. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Okay.